Usually within anime and manga, there is always a portion of the story that I absolutely fall in love with, and it inspires me to want to create content on that particular series. And in the case of Jujutsu Kaisen, it was the Shibuya Incident arc which had inspired me to want to create videos on this amazing series. This arc sees the antagonists of the story, Geto and Mahito, fulfilling their desire of wanting to seal Gojo, and then to summon curses which would wreak havoc upon humanity. Their plan involved lifting four curtains around Shibuya all at once and each curtain has a different purpose. Despite Gojo being the most powerful Jujutsu sorcerer, the antagonists on this occasion came prepared before launching their attack. At the start of the story, the motives of the antagonists were well established. If they were to achieve their desire of destroying humanity, they needed to meet two well-defined conditions. The first of which is to seal Gojo, and the second is to gain the help of the most powerful curse Ryumen Sukuna. During the Shibuya incident arc, it is established that Mahito doesn't care about getting help from Sukuna. Sukuna. He challenges his accomplice Jogo, who wants to gain the help of Sukuna, by stating that if he finds Yuji first, then he can restore Sukuna by giving him the rest of the fingers. But if either Mahito or Chozo find Yuji first, then they are going to kill him. There is a showcase of several different types of domains during this arc, as we are shown several examples of full domains and simple domains. And these of course are revealed to us during the various different fights that take place here. The Shibuya incident arc is littered with strategic battles, and because of the strategy that Agutami he implements into his fights. It ensures that there is no thoughtless fist throwing. The battles are engaging and they have unpredictable outcomes. This is something that Jujutsu Kaisen has always done very well and it is similar to its shonen predecessor Hunter x Hunter. You'll be surprised by the number of characters that play an important role during this arc. Individuals like Sukuna, Toji, Gojo, Todo, and the head of the Zenin family. These are all some of the most hyped characters of the entire story and each of them have their own specific role to play. I feel like I've sufficiently sufficiently hyped up this story arc enough to begin the breakdown and analysis of it. So without further delay, let's begin the highly anticipated analysis of the Shibuya incident arc. Before the video begins, only 20% of the people who actually watch my content are subscribed to the channel. If you enjoy these videos, then subscribe and stick around for more content just like this. Now let's get back to the topic of the video. The Shibuya Incident arc is the longest story arc of Jujutsu Kaisen, beginning in October of 2019 and ending in January of 2021. It takes place between chapters 79 to 136, so spanning a total of 58 chapters. It had marked a considerable change of pace for the story, leading to Akatami pulling all of the stops and delivering to us one of the best story arcs that I've read within any modern shonen series. I would even place the Shibuya Incident arc as one of my favourite manga story arcs. In my opinion, I think that this story arc is as good as the Soul Society arc, the Chunin Exams arc, and even the Kimura Ant arc. So with all of this praise, let me begin by breaking down and analysing what occurs. This arc picks up from where we left off in the last video, as it is revealed that the traitor who is assisting the antagonists was indeed Makimaru. These events occur on October 19th, as the Shibuya Incident arc begins with somewhat of a three chapter prelude, which involves a battle between Mahito and Mekamaru. This is an absolutely insane battle, which leads to Mahito learning about simple domains. During this fight, Mekamaru ends up transforming into his ultimate mode, and it is clear where Akatami has taken inspiration for this design, as it is very similar to an Evangelion unit. Through this three chapter battle, we get to know about Mekamaru a bit more before he dies, and it perfectly sets us up for the events that occur on the 31st of October, which would come to be known as the Shibuya Incident. Earlier I spoke about the well-established motives of the antagonists. Well, thanks to this, we can say that we have been leading up to the Shibuya Incident since the start of the story. In Chapter 10, we learn about the plans of Ghetto and company to seal Gojo using a special grade cursed item called the Prison Realm, and in addition to this, their desire of gaining the help of Sukuna. Now, the Prison Realm, as well as Six Fingers of Sukuna, was stolen by Mahito during the Kyoto Goodwill event arc. They were of course aided by Mekamaru who had served as their mole, so there was a lot of build up and set up for the 31st of October, the day of the Shibuya incident. It is not a mere coincidence that this story arc where Gojo ends up being sealed takes place immediately after the Gojo's past arc. He is the most powerful Jujutsu sorcerer in the entire series, and there is no threat that is beyond the scope of Gojo. But if he is no longer in the story, then that serves to threaten the feelings of safety and reassurance that we feel through knowing that he is around 
if the situation becomes too hopeless. From the onset of this arc, it appeared as though Jogo, Hanami and Chozo had no real chance to defeat Gojo, even in a 3 against 1 situation. Gojo is a type of character who does his best when he is on his own, and this is something that Ghetto reinforces here. The antagonists who anticipate this had created a curtain which prevents anyone from leaving the train station, and thus forcing Gojo into a situation where if he had utilised the extent of his abilities, it would result in collateral damage in the form of the commuters. In addition to this, if Gojo were to utilise his domain expansion within the curtain, it would lead to the civilians being crushed between the curtain and his domain. When you realise all of these limitations imposed upon Gojo, you cannot help but to commend the curses for their level of foresight, leading up to the ceiling of Gojo. They really thought this through. Their patience pays off thanks to their meticulous preparations throughout the story up until this point, and their flawless execution of their plan. All of this takes place on the promised date that was stated by Ghetto as early as chapter 10 of the manga. This clearly foreshadows the beginning of this entire arc, as they hatch their plan to seal Gojo and to acquire the help of Sukuna. Gojo begins his battle with Hanami, Chozo and Jogo, which leads to Gojo finally killing Hanami. Meanwhile, Chozo and Jogo kill the innocent bystanders within the crowded train station. The next phase of their plan involves the arrival of Mahito via a train that is full of transfigured humans. The transfigured humans begin to mercilessly kill the civilians around Gojo. This of course tests the patience of Gojo, and eventually he no longer has the tolerance for their sickening acts. Mahito and company are doing whatever they can to emotionally distress Gojo, in order to force him into making a wrong move or showcasing a slight weakness. However, Gojo fights back by utilising his domain expansion Infinite Void for about 0.2 seconds, which is the time limit for ordinary people to survive within it. In this time, he ends up killing all of Mahito's transfigured humans, but at the same time he slightly injures the ordinary civilians because of his ability. After he does this, the enemy reveals the purpose of luring Gojo on his own by activating the prison realm, as well as the shocking twist that Suguru Geto's body has been taken over by a curse called Kenjaku, and the real Suguru Geto was indeed killed by Gojo during Volume 0 of Jujutsu Kaisen. The distress of the situation and the appearance of Sudo Geto had distracted Gojo long enough for him to be sealed within the prison realm. This all occurs within Chapter 90 of the manga, as it becomes the most shocking installment of Jujutsu Kaisen, as it not only includes the reveal of Sudo Geto, but also the imprisonment of Gojo. As a character, Gojo had to be neutralised, because he has what I like to call the Goku problem, where he is so powerful it is difficult to be convinced that anything or anyone will be a threat to him. Having a character like this, as amazing as he is, takes away the stakes from the story. Preventing the capture of Gojo had quickly become the main objective of the other Jujutsu sorcerers, because if he is captured, it means the end of Japan. When Gojo was born, it signalled a change in the world. No longer could curses carelessly torment humans without repercussions. Cushion. The wielder of the six eyes now exists to hold them accountable, and he possesses enough power to stop any curse. So now that Gojo is out of the picture, we once again have tension within the plot, and you feel concerned for the well-being of the wider cast of characters who are not as infinitely powerful as Gojo. When Gojo is sealed, he remains calm because he has faith in his fellow Jujutsu sorcerers. The fear of Gojo being around had prevented several situations from occurring. Most notably, the execution of Yuji was prevented. Since he he had believed that it is ignorant to just kill Yuji, while ignoring the potential that he possesses in the fight against curses. So after having spoken about Gojo's role within this arc, let's now speak about the various battles that occur and the roles that the other characters had played during the Shibuya incident arc. The first very notable battle that we see is Yuji versus the Grasshopper Curse. It is a fight that demonstrates to us that Yuji can handle things on his own now, and in general it's a really cool one-sided battle. And then through the battle of Ino versus Oga, we have the return of Toji Fushiguro, the father of Megumi. He had been killed by Gojo years ago, but the grandson of Ogami had taken a pill that resulted in his soul being overtaken by Toji's soul. I really loved Toji's character during the Gojo's past arc, so I was incredibly excited to see him stick around for a large chunk of the Shibuya incident. His return certainly lives up to the insane reputation that he had established earlier on. I had a lot of fun seeing Toji face off against the Jujutsu sorcerers and then seeing him take out Dagon, as well as his final final interaction with Megumi. So if his appearance in the escorting of the Star Plasma Vessel had left you itching to see more, then Toji's involvement here will not disappoint. Toji had fought Dagon with the special grade curse tool Playful Cloud, and this is the only curse tool to not be imbued with a curse technique. So it was a perfect weapon for Toji to utilise, as he was able to use it
it in a variety of ways in order to fulfill his desire to take out the strongest on the battlefield, as the power of Playful Cloud is brought out by the strength of the user, meaning that Dargon really didn't stand a chance against Toji once he got a hold of this special grade curse tool. Another excellent fight that occurs where we see Yuji and Megumi work together is their battle against the old guy known as Awasaka. This is a fight that relies heavily on tactics, and the only way for Megumi and Yuji to defeat Awasaka was to find a balance in the force of their strikes in order to counter Awasaka's inverse curse ability. Through this ability, Awasaka was able to weaken strong attacks, but at the same time strengthen any weak attacks. There are several instances where some of the best fights in the series occur during this arc, and it is no understatement when I say that the battle between Chozo and Yuji is undeniably one of the best fights in the entire series, and this is credited to Akatami's unparalleled ability to draw fascinating action within his fights. Chozo has the ability to manipulate blood with his curse technique, and there is an established difference in skill and experience between these two fighters. However, despite this, Yuji is still able to impressively hold his own against Chozo. I would even go as far as to say that they were evenly matched for most of the fight. Yuji was assisted by Mekimaru during this fight, and he was able to prevent Chozo from using his blood manipulation technique, which had allowed for the two of them to partake in a close range battle as they exchange powerful blows. It is really through this fight that we see how far Yuji has come from this start of the series, how much control that he has now over his cursed energy, and it makes you think about how powerful he will become in 10 years time when he is the same age as Gojo. Chozo does end up defeating Yuji in the end by piercing his liver, but at the same time he ends up being affected by Yuji's unknown mysterious ability to implant false memories into the minds of his opponents. Chozo recalls a time where he was sitting with Yuji and his deceased brothers over a table of food. It causes Chozo to be emotionally impacted. As similar to Todo, he starts to believe that he has a brotherly bond with Yuji, and he ends up retreating in order to make sense of this new memory. Like I had mentioned, this instance echoes Yuji's battle against Todo during the Goodwill event arc, as Chozo also develops false memories of Yuji through memories of a past that did not happen. This has happened twice now, and it leads me to believe that this is more than just a coincidence, and it's actually an ability that Yuji possesses. Another incredible set of battles that occur involve the cursed spirit Dagon, as now Bito, the head of the Zenin family, teams up with Nanami and Maki, as they put a considerable amount of effort in order to hurt Dagon, but he proves to be far more difficult and challenging than first anticipated. The head of the Zenin family and the Great One sorcerer Nanami are not enough to defeat him, and when Dagon uses his domain expansion, Horizon of the Captivating Skanda, he activates an ability called Death Swarm, resulting in a number of Shikigami targeting the sorcerers. When the situation had appeared to be hopeless, Megumi appears and hands to Maki the curse tool Playful Cloud, as they attempt to hold off Dagon, while Megumi prepares for their escape from Dagon's domain. Dagon was definitely a dark horse of the story, proving that he was more than just a weak, lowly cursed spirit like Naobito had described at the beginning of their exchange. He made the leader of the Zenin family eat his words by forcing him to utilize the full extent of his abilities, as well as severing his right arm, proving that Dagon is not a cursed spirit to be underestimated. Later, we learn that Toji Yuji's involvement was key to defeating the transformed Dagon. After defeating the Cursed Spirit, his next target ends up being his own son Megumi. Now, During the battle between Megumi and Toji, Megumi doesn't know that he is fighting against his father, and also Toji is kind of a mindless puppet at this point. But through his encounter with Dagon, we know that Toji was still a force to be reckoned with, and it quickly becomes apparent that Toji is too much for Megumi to handle. Through his interactions with Megumi, Toji starts to regain a portion of his memories. We get a short flashback scene that serves to humanize his character, from this image of a merciless assassin that we had come to know during the Gojo's past arc. We learn here that Megumi was sold to the Zenin family by Toji, because he had wanted a better life for his son. He had desired for him to be protected and looked after. He knew that the Zenin family could cultivate Megumi, who he had known possessed potential to become a great Jujutsu sorcerer one day, unlike himself. At the end of their battle, he decides not to reveal his identity to his son, instead feeling content and proud of Megumi, especially after asking him about his last name, and learning that he has taken the surname of Fushiguro instead of Zenin, reassuring Toji that his son is living his own life on his own terms, and not being manipulated by the overbearing shadow of the Zenin name. With this revelation, Toji ends up killing himself without any regret. He does so after regaining the memory of his son, the one who he yet cherished the most, and after he learns about how he is doing, it brings much needed closure to Toji's character. It really made me fall in love with Toji's final moments, and this very brief
brief exchange between father and son. So from one rampaging maniac to the next, let's transition from Toji and speak about how Sukuna gets involved within the story. So the sisters Nanako and Mimiko had fed Yuji several fingers of Sukuna, which had led to the ancient curse spirit taking over. He ends up having two notable fights during the Shibuya incident. The first being against Jogo, and the second being against a Shikigami summoned by Fushiguro called Maharaga. In order to understand how Sukuna takes over, we need to discuss the role that Nanako and Mimiko play, and their motives for taking action. We learn about the twins Nanako and Mimiko at the end of the Gojo's past dog. They had a profound respect for the real ghetto, because he had saved them from the persecution of the villagers who had labelled them as demons, and had made it out as though they were responsible for all of the misfortune that had befallen upon their village. They were indebted to Ghetto and had loved him for saving the two of them. They had known that Gojo killed Ghetto, but despite this, they did not go after him. Well, firstly, because it would be pretty pointless, and secondly, because they were aware that Gojo was Ghetto's best friend, and that the two of them had a mutual respect that had formed between each other after several years of friendship and working together. So instead, they had decided to focus their efforts on targeting the individual who had taken over the body of their former master, this cursed spirit who is defiling the memory of the one that they had admired and who had saved them. The twins desired to kill Pseudo Ghetto, and they tried to do so by awakening Sukuna. They had demanded him to kill their enemy, but this, however, would be their final mistake. The twins had made an order to Sukuna instead of presenting this to him as a humble request. Because of their brash nature, Sukuna immediately kills the two of them. Now, this action reaffirms Sukuna as a character who is not going to soften over time. He is not someone who simply sympathizes with the plights of others, and quite frankly, I love this. It's excellent character writing showcasing consistency, even if it was at the expense of Nanako and Mimiko. Now, when it comes to the battle between Jogo and Sukuna, there's only one way to describe it. It is absolute madness. When Sukuna takes over during this arc, we really understand just how powerful and evil he truly is. Despite this, it is undeniable that he has a likeable charm to him. We love to see him on the page, and you look forward to him utterly dominating his opponents, like he does so with Jogo here. It was truly a one-sided display of power, and it was hardly a fight in my opinion, because at the end of their fight, Sukuna surprisingly makes an attempt to understand Jogo in his final moments, as he asks him if he had desired to become human, or rather, take the place of humans. If Jogo wanted to achieve these desires, then he needed to reach the level of Gojo. He had attempted to fight against Gojo at the start of the story, but he was soundly beaten, and thus it establishes the difference between the two of them. Gojo resides on a level where he no longer has to worry about his future or his identity. He acts without hesitation, because frankly, nobody has the power to question him. Ultimately, Jogo needed to burn everything to the ground in order to fulfill his desire, but he lacked the conviction and hunger to do so. In the final moments of their battle, Sukuna admits that he had enjoyed his fight with Jogo, and that out of all of the opponents that he has faced off against in the last thousand years, Jogo wasn't so bad after all. So for this reason, he tells Jogo to stand proud. He sends him off by praising him that he is strong. In this moment, Jogo realizes that his existence didn't amount to nothing. Being recognized by Sukuna brought some meaning to his life. Sukuna's words caused Jogo to even shed tears in a strange moment where you end up feeling sympathy for the tragic life of a cursed spirit. Sukuna's words help Jogo to accept his death, and if he were to be reincarnated years from now, then hopefully he will have the conviction to follow through with his desire in his next life. Now, the next battle that involves Sukuna has him showcase the extent of his abilities as he faces off against Maharaga. Megumi had summoned the Shikigami Maharaga in an attempt to defeat Haruta. This was pretty much a suicidal tactic, but Megumi had felt that this was a worthwhile risk to take, as long as it leads to him defeating one of the opponents. Just before Maharaga was about to cause havoc, Sukuna arrives on the battlefield and faces off against him. Sukuna utilizes his innate domain Malevolent Shrine, and this ability does not create a new space within a barrier. Instead, it is a divine technique that allows the user to become an artist who paints their masterpiece on air. Malevolent shrine pretty much levels the entire battlefield, murdering everyone, including the Shikigami, and it results in Yuji being considered a threat by the Jujutsu world. After this devastating attack, Sukuna willingly gives Yuji back control over his body, as he shows him the devastation that he has caused across Shibuya. Now, understandably, this sickens Yuji, as he recalls all of Sukuna's actions while he had control over his body. Despite these actions being committed by Sukuna, it is Yuji who will be held accountable for them. He ends up questioning the purpose of his existence as he falls into despair, admitting to himself that he doesn't deserve to be alive. This makes sense because Yuji had lost control over Sukuna, which had resulted in the deaths of countless innocent civilians. It is safe to assume that Yuji would be referred to as 
a murderer, which is a complete contradiction to Yuji's established desire and beliefs. Yuji's beliefs about mortality are questioned and reinforced through the bond that he shares with Sukuna. Yuji breaks down after he is made to witness everything that Sukuna had done while in control of his body. All of these murders he had committed. It leads to Yuji feeling guilty as he takes the blame as he feels like it's his fault. Now this ultimately is the struggle that Yuji has. His desire to protect and cherish the life of others up against the contrasting evil Sukuna who has no respect for the lives of others or Yuji's desire. We know that after his grandfather had died, Yuji decided to save the lives of others and to ensure that he is surrounded by people who love him in his final moments. The decision to eat the finger of Sukuna at the start of the story was because he wanted to save the lives of his friends and Megumi. His actions have led to the manifestation of Sukuna, hence why he feels responsible and he even questions the purpose of his existence during this arc, especially after seeing the devastation caused by Sukuna. To make up for all of this, he attempts to rush into the train station in a desperate attempt to convince himself that he can still do good. He plans to do so by using his powers to help others. However, it is here where he encounters another force of evil that serves to challenge Yuji and his beliefs equally as much as Sukuna. Now, the character of Nanami plays a very important part within the story here. Previously, we had seen that he was badly wounded during his battle against Dagon and then Jogo. So later, when he was confronted by Mahito, he had little strength left to put up a fight against him. And it is here where Nanami is killed by the merciless Mahito, a fan favorite character who left a meaningful impression upon us since his introduction in the fourth arc of the series. It is tragic to see his character meet his end here and I was honestly in disbelief. He had given up the mundane office life and had returned to the world of Jujutsu sorcery in order to feel like he had meaning to his life once more. He has a rare skill which is to exercise curses and he can utilize this to help others. When he understands the responsibility of the gift that he has been given, he abandons his pursuit for money and he thus becomes all the more likable to us. After taking up the role of a Jujutsu sorcerer again, he had met with Yuji who further helped him to reinforce his decision to help others. When Nanami was first introduced, he didn't trust Yuji and he wouldn't recognize him or allow him to fight beside him. But gradually throughout the story, Nanami comes to acknowledge Yuji and in his final moments, he tells Yuji that he has got it from here, leaving the rest to his underling, trusting that he will take down Mahito on his behalf. It is heart-wrenching and it really had me on the verge of tears. What made me feel worse was that Yuji had barely managed to gather the resolve to pick himself back up after Sukuna's rampage and immediately after he was welcomed back to the battlefield with this. So let's now dive into the battle between Mahito and Yuji and how our protagonist's mental state is affected by this recent death. Witnessing Mahito kill Nanami was yet another devastating moment during this arc, an event that rocks Yuji's character to his core. Nanami was a beloved character who grows on you after his introduction during the versus Mahito arc. His character dying serves as another point of growth for Yuji's character, especially after his departing words of encouragement to him. I felt so much sympathy for Yuji during this arc because he endured three notable failures. The first being his loss to Chozo, the second being Sukuna going on a rampage, and lastly, the death of Nanami and later the injury or possible death of Nobara. Both of these final actions were the result of Mahito. After what Sukuna had done, Yuji had referred to himself as no better than a murderer feeling guilty and responsible for killing people when he had sworn to help them. Yuji seeing Mahito again brought back memories of his sickening actions against Junpei, including everything he had done to manipulate him and to eventually kill him and his mother. The pre-established hatred is further fueled through Mahito killing Yuji's mentor Kento Nanami, who had assisted him and had fought alongside him during his last encounter with Mahito. Yuji battling against the enemy here is an act of revenge as well as redemption for himself. His purpose is to separate himself from Sukuna and to affirm that he isn't a monster like his opponent. Yuji is naive and doesn't know that his actions have consequences. His naivety shows in his impulsive moments, like when he had consumed Sukuna's finger, not realizing that it would have a lasting impact upon his life. He is paying the price for this now, while at the same time this serves as a mechanism of growth for his character. Through trial and tribulation we see growth and maturity, and this ends up being true for reality as well as fictional stories. During their battle, Yuji asks how Mahito can play with the lives of others. He responds that Yuji thinks in very simple terms, adding that Yuji is no different to himself. If he does not accept this, then he has no chance of winning in a battle against him. Mahito does not hesitate to kill innocent bystanders during their fight. In particular, when Yuji tries to save someone, they end up being transfigured by Mahito. When Yuji begins to feel isolated in his battle against Mahito, he ends up realizing that he was not alone after all. When he witnesses Mahito be impacted by one of Nobara's abilities, as she was elsewhere facing off against a clone of Mahito. This moment of 
relief is short-lived, as the clone lures Nobara towards Yuji and switches place with the real Mahito, who critically injures Nobara. Yuji understandably assumes that she has been killed because of the devastating nature of the attack, and even we are unsure if she is alive or not after this. This further breaks Yuji's character, as he is then hit by a black flash from Mahito. This is a battle of two ideals or truths. The truth that humans believe in versus the truth that curses believe in. Yuji's question from earlier is contrasted, with Mahito asking if he has ever stopped to count the number of curses that he has killed. Are the lives of humans more valuable than those of curses? Does one deserve to exist more than the other? Yuji's resolve is shaken, and there doesn't seem to be much hope until Todo arrives and assists him. His arrival cannot be understated. He was the perfect character to come to Yuji's aid and to lift up his spirits here. If Todo did not arrive, then Yuji would have given in to despair, and most likely have died at the hands of Mahito. He ends up being convinced by Todo to continue moving forward, because this is the trial that Jujutsu sorcerers must endure. Thanks to Todo supporting Yuji, he is able to lift up his spirits and fight alongside him. During the fight, Mahito undergoes a transformation, revealing a menacing final form that I think does well to convey the higher level of power that he possesses. This transformation served as an excellent final display of strength, and really highlighted to us Yuji's growth as he was able to fight against Mahito on equal ground. Mahito begins to slow down after Yuji's devastating attacks gradually break him down. We learn that Yuji is also able to control the time lag that is brought about through his divergent fist technique, which aids him immensely here. Todo during the battle has his left arm severed, but he is still able to clap as he cites that the applause is an accumulation of the soul, leading to him activating his ability Boogie Woogie, which distracts Mahito, giving Yuji the opportunity to land another black flash against him. At the end of their battle, Yuji realises his role within the world, stating that he is nothing more than a cog in the grand scheme of things. He understands that he is just like Mahito, and that he doesn't need to find a meaning or a reason to fight, because he is going to kill curses like Mahito regardless of it. In the final moments of this battle, a contrast is made, as Akitami reverses the roles of Mahito and Yuji, as the hunter becomes the prey, and this is demonstrated by Mahito fleeing from the fight, as Yuji chases after him like a wolf hunting a rabbit. As long as we have known Mahito, he has always hunted down his opponents in a similar manner, so it is a very satisfactory feeling seeing him get a taste of his own medicine. Before Yuji can kill Mahito, he ends up being devoured by Kenjaku, bringing an end to Yuji's long-standing personal feud against him. In the end, Mahito's character was born out of a fear that all of humanity possesses, which is the fear of death. This ends up giving Mahito a limitless potential for growth in the future, and I don't think that this is the last of him that we'll see. Now coming back to Yuji, this is undoubtedly the most character-defining arc for him. Our protagonist is torn down and deconstructed by Akutami. In the end, what we are left with is a very different person who realises that reality isn't kind to naive idealists, who desire for nothing bad to ever happen to anyone. Yuji's desire to help people appeared to be a simple one, but we now know how difficult it is for him to follow this path. He who values life so much is made to realise that he has killed countless people with his own hands, through being the vessel for Sukuna. It is a complete failure at actualising your desire. Yuji has not succeeded in the slightest, and he was utterly defeated physically in battle and mentally through the blood that is indirectly on his hands. This is really deep character writing, and one of the main reasons why the Shibuya Incident arc is an unforgettable chapter in shonen storytelling. And now when it comes to Megami's character, it is through this story arc that we realise how much potential and room for growth that he possesses. His character we know fascinates Sukuna, as the ancient curse spirit was able to realise Megami's latent potential from the onset of the story. His character is basically hinted at as being the next Gojo, and a clear path is set for Megami to pursue. This was hinted at before, but it's now been established within the Shibuya Incident arc. We are aware that Megami has the Ten Shadows technique. It is an ability that could rival the user of Limitless and Six Eyes, aka Gojo. He has the potential to be another impossible to defeat Jujutsu Sorcerer, as he was able to summon and exercise a curse that no other user of the Ten Shadows technique could. This curse is of course the Divine General Maharaga. It is an incredibly powerful spirit, and it is able to adapt to any phenomenon. No one else has been able to tame the Maharaga, so it is interesting to see where Megumi goes from here, and it also explains why Sukuna went out of his way to keep Megumi alive in this arc. Now let's move on to the final member of the first years of Tokyo Jujutsu High, Nobara Kugisaki. Now, narratively speaking, Nobara's character struggles to attain the same level of meaning or growth as Yuji or Megumi during this arc. 
She is basically there for the sake of fighting against the enemy and being critically wounded so that Yuji falls further into despair. Now the reason why I am in denial about her supposed death during the Shibuya incident is because we have seen so little of her character. She merely supports the protagonist and doesn't have her path in the story defined as well as Megumi does. This is why I want to see her return and prove that Jujutsu Kaisen has strong well-written female characters who subvert established shonen tropes and are able to participate within the story to a similar extent to their male counterparts. This series has already proven that they can do this with the impressive story and premise behind the Zenin family twins Mai and Maki and I know that the same can be done with Nobara. So despite feeling like Nobara is just there and the plot is happening to her, she does have some highlights during this arc, especially her encounter with Maito, how she had utilised her technique resonance to get the upper hand against him. At the end of the arc her fate is unknown as she had her left eye blown by Mahito and I mean she did probably die here and I'm totally in denial because it was so unexpected and it couldn't have happened to a better character but through Nobara's sacrifice it adds to the hatred that Yuji and we as the audience feel for Mahito especially after everything he has done from killing Junpei through to the events of this arc and like I have mentioned I don't think Nobara is dead and she doesn't have to be. It really wouldn't bother me if I saw her again with an eye patch and a scarred face because I feel that we've already had a very impactful death occur during this arc which of course was Nanami's. After she was attacked by Mahito we did get to see more of a backstory that was briefly mentioned at the start of the story as we learn about where she was raised and who she had looked up to and why she desired to leave the village for the city. Nobara had left for Tokyo because she wanted to follow her childhood friend Saori. She had been driven out of town by the villagers as they had developed a hatred for Saori's family. Now in general Nobara as a character still has quite a way to go like I had mentioned so it would be nice to see her return later on especially after knowing more about her past and that her chances of survival are not 0% which is better than nothing. Yet having said this I wouldn't be surprised if Akatami just subverts our expectations like he has been doing and decides to not bring her back which many mangaka don't have the conviction to do. And now moving on to the final moments of the Shibuya incident Pseudo Ghetto breaks the seal on cursed objects as he reveals that he has an ability called Maximum Uzumaki which combines all of the cursed spirits he has consumed into one and allows him to attack his opponent with super condensed cursed energy. The final outcome of the Shibuya incident was an utter defeat for the Jujutsu Sorcerers. The fallout of this arc spans all the way back to the beginning of the series as we learn the identity of Kenjaku who is the individual behind everything that has occurred thus far. It was Kenjaku's plan to team up with Sukuna and to get Gojo out of the picture in some way. His ultimate desire is to recreate the world of Heian which is the golden age of cursed techniques. Kenjaku reveals his true intentions after Jogo, Hanami and Mahito are out of the picture. His main accomplice now being Uraume who assists him in defeating the remaining Jujutsu sorcerers on the battlefield. This is of course before the introduction of Yuki Tsukumo within the present timeline of the story. Now in terms of loss of life there were considerable casualties on both sides of the fight with the cursed spirits losing Hanami, Dagon, Jogo and Mahito who were the main antagonistic figures that we have grown familiar with in the story. While on the side of the sorcerers they had lost the head of the Zenin family Naobito, Mekamaru and who could forget Nanami. Gojo ended up being sealed and Nobara is currently fighting for her life and lastly Yuji has been branded as a criminal and if you want to talk about the loss of life every civilian within Shibuya at the time was killed leaving a devastating impact upon the country as a whole. The Shibuya incident blurs the line between ordinary life and the world of Jujutsu sorcery and cursed spirits and what's worse is that now Gojo is no longer in the story he has been framed as being responsible for the Shibuya incident. He has wrongfully been cited as an accomplice to Ghetto and with this narrative being spread it has become illegal for anyone to attempt to release Gojo from the prison realm. Yuji is also impacted by Gojo's absence as without him nobody can prevent another execution order being placed on him. This I believe now transitions us into a darker portion of the Jujutsu Kaisen story. One in which there is no longer a safety net or a school setting or comfort of knowing that Gojo is around to save the day. I think we are now headed towards a new era of Jujutsu Kaisen and I'm really excited to experience it with all of you. And with that we've concluded my analysis of the Shibuya incident arc and we move on to the Itadori extermination arc which follows the unforgettable events that I have covered within this video. The entire world was impacted by the Shibuya incident. So now that Gojo is imprisoned Yuji's execution sentence has been reinstated and the one ordered to execute Yuji is a special grade sorcerer that we were introduced to during volume 0 of Jujutsu Kaisen. I am of course referring to Yuta Okotsu 
So join me in my next video as we continue to discuss the aftermath of this arc, as well as analyzing Yuta's first appearance within the present timeline of Jujutsu Kaisen. I'm really excited to talk about the more recent story events of the manga, as we are literally about to catch up to the latest arc of the story after my next video in the series. So as always, thank you for making it to the end of the video, and I can't wait to see you in my next Jujutsu Kaisen arc analysis video. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more like it, then please consider supporting my channel on Patreon. I have multiple tiers with rewards including access to an exclusive Discord server, video scripts, as well as being the first to know about unreleased upcoming videos. Thank you for your time and whatever you choose to contribute, I will appreciate and it will mean a lot to me.